The Publishing Wade Franson is the host of Created in the Image of God, a series that examines the role of religion in society, from messianic returns to the emotive responses transmitted through our culture. Wade fearlessly addresses reality claims from all directions, objectively exploring their compatibility with Holy Scripture. Tonight's episode, The Abundant Life, with Angela and Charles Todd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Created in the Image of God show. I'm your host, Wade Franson. We have two very special guests today, two guests that I met virtually when I was down in Florida, and they were down in Florida, but with technology and traffic in Florida, we still felt it was better to just meet virtually. And we did a sneak peek, which I'm hoping many of you saw. And if so, you know that you're in for a treat tonight. Angela and Charles Todd, uh, who are the founders of uh, Todd Worldwide Ministries have a very special and somewhat different um, ministry, if you will, than some of the people we've had on the show. And I think it's going to lead to a very, very fascinating discussion. Topics that are important in this modern world um, as we try to walk the walk, uh, being in the world, but not of the world. So without any additional introduction, I'm going to bring them on stage. They also are separated by distance tonight in two separate studios so they're dialing in from different areas so we'll welcome angela and uh her husband todd welcome guys thanks for having us wade so just share quickly where you're at physically right now and um why it is that you're separated tonight well physically angela's at home in destin i'm in north carolina our daughter's a professional pickleball player so I'm here with her right now. She starts a tournament, tournament but she also uh, is right in the middle. They're doing the major league pickleball draft. So there's a big draft going on for the team. So you hear anybody? Yes, Angela. I'm sorry. What's up, Angela? We, we hear each other, I think, fine. Can you hear us? Or are you having audio? Can you not hear Angela? It sounds like she's not uh, not hearing us. So well, we'll just we'll, we'll, um, there's there's a private chat. Let me just um, hear. yeah. <laughs> uh, we hear you. We hear each other. I don't know if you can see that in the private chat. I can see that. Um, so uh, hopefully she will see that message. So I'll, I'll try kicking her out and kicking her back in. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> while, um, while you, um, I'm going to finish up where I'm at and where I am. Yeah. While, while, while you just continue, I think, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm at an Airbnb for one thing. So it's a little different than a studio setting. Um, like I said, my daughter's downstairs. She's on the phone with her, some of her new teammates. They're still doing the draft. And we also have, uh, one of the newscasters here doing some, uh, audio and video with her as well too and angela's back at home watching them base for us well and and um pickleball uh, she's back now we'll see if if that, can you hear us now can you hear now angela okay. maybe take um, your in and out yeah um <laughs> that was great when it works <laughs> yeah um well so tell tell us just briefly um how, what about professional pickleball? Because um, I actually have played it a few times and love it, yeah. but I, I didn't know there was like a professional circuit. Yeah, professional circuit started about four or five years ago, I guess, maybe a little earlier than that, um, kind of with one league, then it went to two leagues and three leagues. And now they're starting international leagues and trying to get into the Olympics as well, too. So it's been the number one fastest growing sport in America for, I think, the last couple of years. So um there's just a lot of interest there's new facilities going up all around the country all around the world really so um i think the one of the things that really helped it to explode was during covid you know when people didn't have a place to go they could go and they could play this and that's when a lot of the professionals started and it really gave people an opportunity for community because all ages can play from you know young kids all the way up i mean we live in a neighborhood in Destin, Florida. So there's a lot of retired people. So people of 70 and 80 are playing as well as younger. So it really brings 
all ages together, all family members together, and it's really a source of community. So that's been one of the, I think the interesting things about it to me is just the bringing people together. Yeah. So, um, sorry, just we've got we've got a technical help uh, trying to help Angela now in the back studio. Okay, so we'll just we'll just run with it. So, sure. um, you know, this is the portion of the show where we get to know your origin story and. Um, yep. You and I and Angela talked about this when we were doing the sneak peek, um, but please share with our audience, you know, where you come from historically. And by that, I mean your parents, where they're from, where you were born and those very early life experiences that the, the cultural context in which you grew up and, and those things that shaped you. Yeah, I was born in Wichita, Kansas. When I was three years old, we moved to Colorado. I was pretty much raised in Colorado from three years old all the way into my first year of college before then I went to California, was there for 37 years and, until we went to Florida just a couple years ago. Uh, but I spent most of my summers on the farm in Kansas uh, with my grandmother, with my aunt and uncle. Um, my parents were divorced, married and divorced a couple times from the time I think when I was six years old, so very early. So I kind of went back and forth between households and the summertime was really the stable time in my life to be able to spend with my grandmother and then with my aunt and uncle who had a cousin. I had a cousin who's a year younger than me. So that's where I was really put into the church. My grandma was a good old Southern Baptist, you know, with the potlucks and everything she did was around church from, you know, we would go Sunday morning to one of the senior citizen centers and she would do church and lead worship and I would help her with that. And then it would be the Sunday school and then it was church and the potlucks after and every Wednesday night. And then when I would go to, to Wichita, then when I was off the farm with my aunt and uncle, they were Catholics. So I would go to Catholic church. So it was a very uh, dynamic being in the different types of settings or whatever. And then when I went back home, I was kind of out of that whole church mode. Um, and then back to the summer times, back into that. So I really, have to accredit my grandmother for really being the foundation of kind of putting me in a church setting and kind of giving me that, you know, that foundation that I really needed. And that never left me. Um, even, you know, when I was with my parents, sometimes back in Colorado, I would go to church with friends or whatever. So I always had that kind of like that spiritual connection with God, even as a child. Um, and have had that through my entire life, um, but was never, I guess, you know, even up until my twenties, I would say, wasn't living the way according to the word, <laughs> you know, well, I wasn't doing the things I wasn't, uh, I wasn't tithing. I wasn't giving, I wasn't doing, you know, serving. I was doing none of that. I would basically, I would go to church on Sunday night. And it wasn't until Angela and I met, that uh, I had a number of different types of businesses. I was, I had health food stores, um, then I had restaurants, I was in the nightclub business, and that was when Angela and I met. So I was in the booth. <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of which, she's back now, and she can not only speak, she can also hear. Yes. Hi. Thank you. I'm. I'm sure I missed the juicy part sound like it just came in on the juicy no, part I just, we met I just got club. to that part so you're right at your right time because she likes to get on this one so anyway so here i'm running <laughs> nightclubs seven days a week but me and angela are going to church on sunday so you know. so so how so the running nightclubs um that doesn't sound like a typical you know devout church going kind of activity especially for a southern baptist background it was not. And, and my my life really my 20s up until i guess when angela and i were married and we had our daughter paris i was 31 or something so my whole 20s and up to that was there was really no devotion i guess to you say i still went to church on a regular basis but i didn't know the promises of god mm -hmm. i didn't know any of the things i mean i would read scripture or whatever but I, I never really had any revelation of scripture i don't think um so like we i were said church, we were pew warmers we were just warming the pews well i'm gonna Imagine. i'm gonna i'm gonna share a personal anecdote that i haven't shared with you guys and nor with my audience this is well documented in in my first book the people of the sign but um i grew up i didn't grow up but, but when i when i became a teenager 
I was now living in a household um, with a father who was extremely zealous and extremely focused on obedience to God. And the the commandment that I had the biggest problem with was honor your father and mother because, <laughs> well, by that time, my mother was an alcoholic who was, she, she had she had died when I was 16. Oh, I'm sorry. And I'd been, I had not seen her in five years except, or in, excuse me, in four years except for once um, when my dad brought her up to Alaska in some kind of effort at reconciliation and she was just drunk the whole time. Um, but it was my dad that I had a problem with because I blamed him for all this. And um, it's a long story, you know, domestic kidnapping, being smuggled out of the country, Supreme go, course, court case went up to the Supreme Court of Sweden, which is why I held my dad responsible. Um, but, but I did come to believe in the Bible and the promises of God, and I committed myself to that fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, because it's the first commandment with a promise, right? <laughs> It says that it's the first commandment with a promise that your days may be long on the on the land yeah. that the Lord thy God gives thee. So I knew I would, you know, end up like my mother or worse if I didn't solve this anger and hate that I had for my dad. Um, but he continued to not be the father in the prodigal son story, right? So for example, <laughs> when I then moved out and was trying to save up money to get a car, my dad refused to co-sign the loan for me. So I was not able to get a car. And I was driving a motorcycle up in Alaska, working two jobs in the winter, right? To try to pay for my apartment. So I had been saving up my tithe money in the bank. <laughs> I like and, <laughs> you know, I just hadn't... Had, Hadn't sent it in yet is all, right? <laughs> so it's, in, it's in the earthly bank. It's not in the bank of heaven. Well, no, but no, I literally, I, I had an account, right? So we did not do weekly offerings. You sent it in. Mm. And, you know, you sent it in every so often. And so, but for whatever reason, it was beginning to add up. And by the way, we believed in 10% of the gross income. 10% of your gross because God's claim comes first. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's the right interpretation in all the circumstances. And but we also paid three tithes, which is a whole nother Oprah. Right. We paid the first tithe to God, the second tithe to observe his holy days as they were found in the Old Testament. And the third tithe was for the widows and orphans, which sadly was largely gobbled up by the ministry. But that's, again, a whole nother story. The point is, there was a rather. Was that, was that 30 percent then? It was 30% of your gross. However, third tithes was only every three years, or rather, more specifically, two years out of seven, because the seventh year was the year of forgiveness. So you had two three-year cycles, and then you, you were off for a year, and then you started over, right? So it averaged out to about 23 whatever percent of your gross income, a lot of money. Now, the feasts were amazing, the, the holy days. We saved up 10% of our gross income, and we partied like crazy. And um, <laughs> we did so as a church, and it was awesome. It was a foretaste of the kingdom of God. I don't need to go deep into this. I'm, I just want to get to this one point. point is I had this money in the bank, full intent to send it in. It was God's money, and I knew it. However, because my dad refused to co-sign the loan, my anger issues with my dad took over. And I decided to spend that money on a car. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> um, the car I was able to afford was a, a little Honda Coupe, two two cylinder air cooled engine, um, and Honda basically almost ruined their entire market in the U.S. I wanted a Civic, is what I wanted back, way back then, but I got this used Honda Coupe, and um, I was probably driving it too fast, air cooled engine, whatever. Um, overheated, one of the pistons broke off and went through, or one of the valves broke off and went through the piston. So the engine was totally toast and I had to like leave it by the side of the road. And when I came back a couple of days later, some rowdies had turned the car over on its side because oh it was this gosh. tiny little car. So within a few weeks of having spent my tithe money on this car, it was totaled. It was gone. <laughs> it was totaled. And then I got sick. And couldn't oh work. Right? So what'd you learn? <laughs> yeah, what I learned is um, 
God is tithe. Trust in God. <laughs> trust in God and stand in awe. Now, I am not here to teach the specifics of tithing or any tithing system. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm not here to teach doctrine. It's not the point of this show. All I'm saying is I can relate to your story. Yeah, I mean, with us, we, you know, we're going to church and I really, I mean, occasionally you'd hear about the tithe, but it may have been once a year. I mean, you hardly ever heard anything, at least me, be coming from Baptist church and then Catholic church. And then when I would go to church by myself or with my friends, wherever I was at, it was usually non-denominational. You just didn't hear about that money. You don't hear any. So you're raised in a household where your parents don't teach you a thing about money. You go to school, grade school, high school, college. I had six years of college. Nothing. Nobody taught me anything about money. Go through economics and macroeconomics and all this type of stuff. And you learn about, you know, supply and demand, aggregate current, that type of stuff. But do you ever learn how to reconcile a checkbook or really how to budget? <laughs> I mean, some of the basics. Stuff. How do you handle money? I mean, come on, guys. Right. So, you know, we just never had learned that ever. So, you know, what ended up happening with us was, in the nightclub business, and I'm going to be really open here. I'm not. Sh I'm going to share some dollar figures, maybe throughout the night, um, just so that I'm very uh, transparent with people, so they kind of know the level that things were going on. And I don't like to do that. I typically don't do that very often. You can ask me. To, I don't share figures, but at the point in the early '90s, we're taking home about fifty thousand dollars a month. So in the '90s, if you're making fifty grand a month, you're doing pretty good. You should be able to live a pretty decent life. Um, but we weren't, we we're going into debt <laughs> because we were spending, we were hyper consumers. I go look at cars. I like the red one and the black one. I bought them both, you know, that type of stuff. So as your income went up, your credit score, you know, went up because you're paying stuff off and then you start getting off all these credits. So you just, we just kept diving farther and farther into debt. And so what ended up happening was I had a revelation that, the nightclub business probably is not going to be the best business for me to be in to marry and have a daughter. So at that point, after Paris was born, I said, okay, I'm out, uh, broke off the partnerships, walked away. Uh, we went back to California um, because basically the income stopped. So when you have $50,000 of revenue a month and you have more bills than that, and it stops, whatever money that you have runs out very quickly. And you start selling stuff, watches and cars and that type of stuff, whatever it may be. So we ended up back in California in Angela's parents' parents' basement because we couldn't afford to pay rent anymore. Uh, we watched our cars get towed away, um, ended up going through bankruptcy. Um, bankruptcy allows you to get rid of all your credits. Like if you have houses or cars or credit cards, that type of stuff, the things that it does not allow you to, uh, to bankrupt is student loans and back IRS payments. And I had back IRS payments of six figures. I had student loans of, I forget how much, 40, $50,000, something like that. So after bankruptcy, still hundreds of thousands of dollars still in debt. So- it And that IRS it. interest uh, and penalty charge is not uh, yep. to be- That's right very quickly. And to, to that comment, within about a three or four year period that doubled those payments. So right, right. Um, the financial stress led to Angela and I getting divorced and typical divorce. I mean, if you look at statistics, 70% of divorces are financial problems. So it's a big problem. And that's not just in the world that's in the church as well too. Uh, another statistic that Angela and I like to share when we've taught our 10 week financial courses before is that 70% of prayer requests are for healing and for finances. So it's just not a problem in the world. It's a problem in the church as well, too. So we get divorced. I'm out. And so I get enough money together to buy an old beater car, Bailey. And I end up living out of my car for a year. Two-cylinder Honda Coupe, something maybe a little bit better than that. I didn't, I didn't have my tithing money saved up, so I didn't do that. So my car didn't blow up the next week. Thank God. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But I have... I thought, okay, I get a place to live and then what do I do for work or I can get a car because that will give me access to work to go and do the things that I was trying to do. So I lived in my car for a year, basically, staying with friends here and there, um, hotel occasionally. Uh, and it's, it sounds like a riches to rag story. 
And it really <laughs> was. I mean, talk, if you want to talk about heating rock bottom, I mean, I couldn't have a checking account because the IRS or this, even the state would seize my money. So at one point had no place to live, no car, no bank accounts, no job, no business, no money, lost my wife, lost my relationship with my daughter, complete, utterly bankrupt. And so it's given us a place of, to teach other people from a place of compassion, because sometimes when I'm sharing with people, I'm trying to help them in whatever way it is through encouragement or sharing money management, they'll say things like, we don't know how hard it is. And so I can ask, do you have a bank account? Well, yeah, I got a bank account. Okay, you had more than I had. Do you have a car? Well, yeah, I have a car. Do you have a place to live? Anything that any one of those answers that I would, or questions I would ask somebody, if they had one of those, they were better off than I, I was. So sometimes just that can be encouraging because sometimes when you're down in the dumps, you think like nobody's ever had it as rough as I have. And I think really from a, a kind of a, a teaching or an encouragement perspective, sometimes it will allow you to kind of bond with people. Just like, for example, maybe if somebody's been a, a drug addict and has, has got recovered and gone through that, then sometimes they'll be able to relate to other drug addicts a little bit more because they know what it's like to be there. Say, hey, you know, what? I know what it was like to be on those drugs. And when you thought you couldn't get away with them, there's no way. And you thought about taking your life and all that type of stuff. So there's a connection there. So, you know, we really have been able to use that um, to help to do that, just to kind of come from a place for compassion. Because sometimes I think that now the position that we're at now that, you know, people, if they know, Hey, you got a big house and you have fancy cars and you had a business for 20 some years and you have all this you can't relate to me and my so my whole point is yes i can relate because <laughs> I've, I've been there before so a year after me and Angela are separated i'm starting to get some work going again angela starts the company that we have now um, our daughter uh, suffers an injury she's i'm staying with one of my friends paris is with me She's playing on his back. She falls off, cracks her skull. Long story short, we're in the emergency room. We end up in Chalk Hospital in Orange County, California. She's got multiple fractures, uh, bubbles on the brain. They want to monitor her. They think they might have to do surgery. It's touch and go. They don't know what her condition is going to be. Um, and just to kind of fast forward the story for sake of time is that Angela's in New York. She flies back. We come together. We pray over her. Within a day, she's miraculously healed. They do the new MRIs or the x-rays, whatever they do. There's no bubbles on the brain. There's absolutely zero cracks and fractures in the skull. 100% healed. Went home. She never had any other effects from that. And one of the miraculous things about that is we never even got one medical bill with everything that we had that we went through with that. Well, and to, to that, I also like to attribute that story to the power of the praying mother. And so as parents, I was, it's so I was, I was about to ask for your perspective, Angela. So thank you. Yeah. Well, um, his mother, um, you know, they were missionaries in Ashkirkstan and, you know, just super strong in their faith. And they were always praying for you know, obviously our relationship because they were, you know, they were the hearers of what was going on. And, you know, the, you, you know, as a parent, you see what's going on in your children's lives. I mean, they don't even have to say anything and you know something's rotten in Denmark. And she was praying. And I, anyway, the power of the praying mother is, is key and the father, especially the father in the household. So if you've got strong praying parents continue to pray over your children every day they're never too old to continue to pray and they're, you're always going to be in that position and in that spiritual um authority in their lives so uh his mom i had a lot to do with with that in my opinion uh especially his grandma too and when she was still alive um but yeah he sugarcoated a lot of uh obviously the the good old days, <laughs> life in the fast lane, um, sure to make it lose your mind, which obviously we did. Um, but to his thing, you know, he was beat over the head with the Bible in the Baptist church. My mom was new age. So it was grab your crystals and pray to the crystals and, you know, your energy and your mantras and, you know, that kind of thing. And I was born and raised in the catholic church so you know stand up sit down fight 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 and i was confused I mean, and then i met him and i was like what church and 
Anyway, we ended up going to a Holy Spirit filled church in as called the River um, in Anaheim. It was a four square church. And that was the first time I had been into the presence of the Holy Spirit, where they were, it was, it was tangible, it was strong. And you could, you could feel the heat and the sensation through your body. And it just blew my mind. I was like, what is this? And it, that just changed our lives forever. It was just having that encounter with God um, in a personal way, being filled with the spirit like that. Um, and so, you know, get filled with the Holy Spirit. It'll change your life forever. Amen. So I'm, I'm glad we had the time to allow both of you to unpack a little bit those early experiences. <clears throat> We're going to take a commercial break. And in this case, the commercial is going to be an ad that you've produced that that uh, Money Mike tree behind Angela there, <laughs> um, because they have written four books currently, I believe, in a series. Yes. And um, as we always do on the show, we're going to be giving away a book to the commenter that um, provides comments that our guests <laughs> like at the end. So I want to, I want to, I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing lots of great comments um, already, and I want to encourage that to continue. We're going to go to this ad, and when we come back, I'm going to sort of soften the ad with a verse, but I'm going to ask a very tough question of Angela and Charles. Um, because this ad will be a little different than some of the ones that our guests have seen on the show before, um, but it'll tee up the uh, the discussion to come. So don't go anywhere. You're on Created in the Image of God with Wade Franson. I'm here with Angela and Charles Todd. We're talking about the abundant life, and um, we'll have more about that when we come back uh, right after this. Hey kids, it's Money Mike. I'm lean, I'm green, and I'm a money machine. Welcome to my new book, Money is Easy, where I branch out with glee, revealing the message, money is as easy as counting one, two, three. This is my first book in the Money Mike in the Gang four book series, where I get together with my good friends and reveal hidden secrets in my tree leaves that pay dividends. I'll teach you three simple steps on how to get rich so you can tell a friend and also help their lives to be enriched. So check out my new book and you will see that money really is easy. As easy as counting one, two, three. Welcome back. That was Money Mike, the money tree, I believe. Uh, Charles, Angela, tell me a little bit about that ad and what the heck is that? <laughs> Go ahead. Money Mike uh, is Charles's alter ego. Um, we were teaching, uh, he was teaching 10 week financial courses to the body of Christ at Free Chapel Church in Irvine, California. It was a transplant of Jensen Franklin. He's got like four or five different campuses. I spent um, several years working in Irvine. Know that well. Yeah. And so Orange we were County, on... Orange County, right? Yeah. Uh, see, baby. Yep. The, the OC, the Orange Curtain. And we were uh, prayer team leaders. And so we were praying for businesses every, I think, Thursday morning at 7 a.m. Whether you believed or you didn't believe or you just want to pray for your business, you would, we had, we would pack the we would pack the house and we would just lay hands on everyone and pray for their businesses to be successful in Orange County. And we did that for a long time for a, a few years. And then uh, one of the prayer team leaders um, asked Charles if she, if he would teach ten week financial course. It was called School of Discipleship. And um, to back up that story, he was sitting out on the patio one day just reading his favorite book by Kenneth Copeland, The Laws of Prosperity. And the Lord spoke to him sitting in his chair, you know, will you, will you teach finances to the body of Christ? And his first response, and I'm, I'm now reiterating your story, babe, uh, was I'm not qualified. And the Lord said, he's like, well, okay, if, if I'm going to do this, then you're going to have to bring it to me because I'm not going out looking to go and teach finances. Like, that's the last thing I want to do is A, get up in front of a class and B, teach money to people. I mean, he's like, you know. He didn't want to do it. 
So the next day at church, this was Saturday, on Sunday, we're together, we're leaving church, and one of the prayer team leaders comes running after Charles. Charles, 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 she waves him down. We're starting the School of Discipleship. We're gonna speak, we want you to teach on money. Will you teach this class on money? And he was like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe this. It was the next day. So he's like, well, I have to think about it. <laughs> so right now he's gotta think about it. Um, so of course we talked about it and, and, and that was the first run of, this was like in 2020, right before COVID hit, because we taught two 10 week financial courses before COVID. And uh, so he would go into his prayer closet and get a message and he built a whole unique curriculum around each class. So he didn't just like teach a class and use some textbook and try to teach, you know, students information that was just from someone else. He took it, he digested it, he chewed on it, he studied it he got it inside of him he prayed about it he was like lord you've got to give me a word for these students what are, what did they need to hear and so that's how he created this curriculum plus also asking if he could take what he had learned because we have learned from i don't know how many how many other people babe like eight or ten other ministries that have ministered to us and just taking that information and just putting his own curriculum together so that curriculum for those specific classes became what the kids version of the content is for money mike in the game and he got the download for the kids um brand when he was you know he's praying in the spirit he's putting his curriculum together and the lord said children's books and he was like who has time for that I don't know. I'm not even a writer, right? <laughs> he had no, he had no writing experience. He didn't. It, it was just a sheer grace of God that. A little bit, a little bit different from the nightclub business. Yeah, exactly. It was a straight up download, and so, you know, during COVID, he's yeah. It was just like, when are you going to write the books? When are you going to write the books? Well, who has time? You know, we've got a business. We've got a ministry. We've, we're doing all these things, and, you know, when the world shut down during COVID. Now there was no excuse. And so I just said, just do a stick figure on paper. I'll take it. I'll take it to an illustrator. Just throw up on paper. If that's the, cause I write. So I'm just like, just do it. I'll just take what you put down and we'll make it great and we'll do it together. And he did, he spit out, you know, these little stick <laughs> figures with all this stuff. And uh, brought it to an illustrator and brought the whole thing to life and then got the editors and, you know, as the book so process I'm goes, you get it out. punchline now. Because <laughs> she said all what that. What was that, Charles? I'm going to take us to the punchline. Angela okay. gave us a very good backstory of how we got to the punchline here, which is Money is Easy. That's our first book. We have Money is Easy, Saving is Easy, Giving is Easy, and then the other one is Stay Out of Debt with the Loan Shark. So it's about staying. So each component has, obviously, it's teaching lesson. But what I kept hearing the whole time when teaching on budgeting and different types of money handling techniques is people say, it's so hard, budgeting is so hard. So one thing that I always would tell people is change your words. If you keep saying it, because Proverbs 18 and 21 says, life and death are in the power of your tongue. If you keep saying something as hard, as hard, as hard, it's gonna be hard for you. If you say it's easy, it's gonna be easy for you. So the first thing is you have to change the mind. So I started telling people, say that money is easy. So that's where we got the whole term money is easy. It was a whole revelation of from getting people to change their mindset about money and to use their words appropriately. Okay. Well, I think that's the perfect segue to the hard question that I promised the audience I was going to ask you. And that is that um, uh, Jesus, you know, was taken up by the devil to the top of a of a mountain or of a, mm -hmm. of a building and a high place where he could see the earth and he was offered everything, right? Riches, uh, power, glory. Um, and that's a typical example of many that might come to mind for Christians and other religious people where self-sacrifice, self-abnegation, right? the mind of Christ, of, of lowering oneself, of humbling oneself, of esteeming others better than oneself. So the, the ideas in our head 
um, both good and bad, as you as you pointed out, do govern the results and the outcome in our life, right? And so, in a Christian context, there's a lot of uh, ambivalence, which means you know I'm not so sure about what you're saying there because it seems like it's the opposite of what I should be doing as a spiritual person to be focused on money. And um, there's this thing out there called the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, where people turn the gospel message into something more physical. At least that is the that is the accusation or the argument against it. So I asked you this down when I was down in Florida and um, wanted to make sure that, you know, this tough question was asked so that we're striking the right balance here. So um, let's get into some scriptures and um, I'll let you respond first, but then one comes to my mind to sort of support what you're saying here and doing. Well, first of all, when Satan was offering Jesus those things, Jesus already had it. He already had the kingdom. And the Bible says that Jesus became poor so that we'd be made rich. So he was already rich. And we're, I'm talking finances here. I'm talking money. Okay, because we're, we're talking about money. So first of all, let me clarify something that prosperity is completeness. It's not just money. Having money, health, relationships, peace, protection, it's, it's shalom. It's completeness. So you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have your health, how do you enjoy it? Well, there's there's also the there's also the narrative around Jesus, and this is to me fascinating. Um, you know, we think of you know Jesus, the poor carpenter, who was like the foxes who had no place to lay his head, but that's probably not the reality of the of the physical material circumstances of Jesus, who was certainly a skilled craftsman in his trade as a carpenter. Well, there's also when the three wise men came as he was a child and gave to his mother all of the wealth and the riches that they gave and presented to the baby. So there's no account. Yeah, wh whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to all that money? He, he was yeah. already set up with a trust fund before he even graduated, before his mother was like, where is my son? And he's like, you should know where I'm at. I'm in my father's house. He was already a trust fund baby because when he was brought into this world, they brought him all of those riches. So before he could even know what they even were, what to do with them, do you know what I mean? So you could you could argue however you want. He was yeah. You, well, well, so in other words, what you're saying is Jesus actually gave something up. He wasn't impoverished and poor from birth based on those gifts. Well, impoverished and poor from giving up heaven I would say, you know, you when you have the kingdom is on the inside of you. Like he was just saying, Jesus had or he is every he is everything. He is the whole package. He's wealth, prosperity, he's riches, he's health, he's wholeness. He he is all that man in the flesh here on the earth to show us how to live that way. Well, you, and by his he, stripes we are healed. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So what other scriptures then or what what are some of the scriptures that you might bring to mind to support this position i'm going to read some of these typically like when we're on our podcast or teaching i'll just rattle off scriptures or whatever and then our editors will put it on but i'm going to actually read them just mm -hmm. so that we know thank you don't have anything edited um, i'll read a couple different things and i'll kind of back these up um, first of all is proverbs 10 22 from nlt it says the blessing of the lord makes a person rich and he adds no sorrow to it and that rich word in the Hebrew is ashar, which means to accumulate and grow rich. So a lot of times I think it's important to get the scripture in its context. And also sometimes too, whether or not you're in the Old Testament, New Testament, to look at the Hebrew and to look at the Greek as well too, because sometimes people will try to spiritualize this by saying that it's not actual material things. Right. So, and certainly it is. And certainly the spiritual is more important than the physical, but... That yeah. doesn't mean that the physical is not important. Part, part of it too. Right. So let me get one more here. Deuteronomy 8.18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is today. So 
he gives us the power to do something. So first of all, if he blesses us, if he gives us the blessing to be rich and he gives us the power to get rich, why would he give us the power or give us those promises if he didn't want us to have that? So to, to me, it's very clear. And one of the things like we didn't really talk about the part where when we came out of bankruptcy and all that, we started you know, looking. The thing that I want to do is who is teaching about money in the church? Because I need to know because Hosea four and six says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Or the second part of that is they reject knowledge. And right. if you look up um, knowledge, let me go back, back here. I think I have that in my notes. Um, destroyed. My people are destroyed. Destroyed means in the Hebrew to, to be dumb or fail. So this is what was going on with me is I was dumb and I was failing in my finances because I didn't know what the word of God had to say. The flip side of that is when people actually know some scriptures and they'll hear somebody such as maybe myself sharing those, but they'll reject it. So they'll say, no, nah, I don't believe that. I don't, that's not what I feel. You know, money's the root of all evil, which they just quoted the scripture wrong because it's the love of money. It's the wrong relationship with money is what causes that. So, And it's not the, the root either. It's a root. The love of money is a root of all evil. There are many other roots of it as well. And I'd like and, to explain yeah. that from the perspective that it's the wrong relationship with money. Like some people will use people to get money. I like to get money to bless people. And part of my daily declaration is that I'm a blessing to be a blessing. I'm a distribution center. And you go back to Genesis 12 and two, and this is one of our foundation scriptures for our ministry that we've gone on 18 years, 19 years, I think it is, is, is exactly that Genesis 12 two. And God said, I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Why did he want Abraham to be blessed so that he would be a blessing? And then when you fast forward to Genesis 13 and two, it said, Abraham became very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And I think it's very descriptive there that those are material things so that people wouldn't try to spiritualize it and say, yeah. well, it's to be rich in the spiritual sense. It's to be rich in your prayer life. And yeah, all those things as well too. But this is specific talking about money. So what I was saying early, you know, you've got to take it in as in the context that it is and get, get the, the value of it so that you can receive those promises because it's through belief. It's, you know, faith works by believing in God's word, period. And there are spiritual laws out there that will work for anybody that gets involved, just like gravity. Yep. Gravity well, and, and, and that's a, that's another segue to the, to the verse that I wanted to share. And, and I'm going to actually project this one out on the screen. Um, I put it in the chat across all channels. Uh, this is one of my favorite verses. This is from Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, verse 6. Without faith, is it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And I, and I usually focus on this part primarily because I love the intersection of science and religion, science and faith. And I like to show the scripture to say that science will never discover God. Never, right. never. And it's not it in... Makes doesn't make sense. It's not intended to. Well, not even yeah. that. It's the, the nature of science, and there's nothing wrong with this. The nature of science is to be agnostic, right? <laughs> right. And so, therefore, you don't believe that he is, right? So you yeah. cannot come to him. And that's yeah. fine. That's okay for science. Um, but if you believe that he is, yeah. then he will reveal himself to you. Absolutely. If, if, if you not only believe that he is, but also that he is a rewarder yes. of those who yeah. casually <laughs> peek, peek occasionally under a napkin to see if he showed up overnight. No, 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 no. no. Diligently seek yeah. him, right? So, if you believe that he is and that he will reward you, that's that's the story of Jacob wrestling with God all night with God putting his hip out of joint and telling the angel, I will not let you go. Even though I'm now in pain and limping and exhausted, I will not let you go until you bless me. <laughs> and a diligent man who can find. 
<laughs> right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you find a diligent man, hang on to him, which gets to the question. So, Angela, why did you decide to marry this guy again after you divorced? Sorry to <laughs> segue. She's still was... trying to figure that out. <laughs> 25 years later, she is probably asked something. Why did I marry that guy again? You know what? I loved him. I loved, I loved, I loved who he was. I just loved him. Oh, and she was very was... forgiving. And then Charles, you must have seen that Proverbs 31 woman whose price is above rubies and you hang on to her. You don't let her go if she is also faithful to God and beautiful as well as everything else that she is. Well, I can, the entire year that we were separated and we actually were divorced. It was a legal divorce. The entire time, I never, ever lost my hope that I would be back together with her in Paris again. And I can still remember like it was yesterday, the couple times, like occasionally once a week or whatever, I would get a hotel so I could like shower normally and sleep in a bed instead of a car. I still remember kneeling down against that bed and praying for her in Paris. I never gave up. I just, for some reason, there was just something in me that said that it worked. And it did. And when we, when we did get back together, like I said, it's like, this time we're going to do it right. And we started with the money portion of it because that was our major problem, you know? So I think, you know, some people say, well, you talk about money, your, your, your ministry speaks a lot about money. That's just our call. That's something that God has, has blessed us with. We're something that we had the biggest issue in our life. I've never had a problem with health. I've always been very healthy. Never, I don't go to the doctor. I don't take pharmaceutical persons for anything. Um, how pretty sound and let's sound. not ask about vaccinations go ahead <laughs> <laughs> but my, my point is is that my my failure is wait I where did you say you live florida we were just down there anyway go ahead <laughs> my, my failure or my struggle has been finances and how to handle yeah. those appropriately so yeah. what god has blessed us so much with and changed our perspective on how we think about money how we handle money um, yeah. i'm just thinking well, i love you know, my segue yeah. up to this is that, you know, even just the ability to now just to go in the grocery store. And once again, I'm not bragging about myself or our business or where we had our own business 25 years. I'm giving glory to God because I came to a place of complete bustedness, having nothing where I can walk into the grocery store. Just the other day, I was like, I can buy anything I want and not even have to look at the price and get whatever I want. And I'm not going to say that. that's not bragging. It's just the place that I'm at now because money really matter that much to me anymore. And I'm not saying that I'm not diligent on how I manage it, but from the perspective of from money doesn't control me anymore. I control money and I use money yep. to bless people versus I think when you're like an illustration I like to use is like a lot of times we think of that scripture, the love of money is really, we think of rich people. We think it's rich right. people who are abusing that, doing that. But you can have somebody that can be completely broke and all they're thinking about is <laughs> money, 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 money. How am I going to well, pay my bills? And I remember having my bills stacked up and yeah. trying to, I pay one bill as the money come in. And all I was thinking about is how am I going to get enough money to pay my bills and staying up at night? Well, not being able to sleep, not yeah, sleep. not, not, not only that, sleep. but you know, there, there are a number of verses that, that advise us and warn us to do whatever we can to not get into that situation where, you know, you're going to, you're going to start compromising with God's law out of necessity, you believe in your mind, right? Because now your faith is really, really being tested as to whether you're going to be obedient, you know, when circumstances are so dire that you begin to justify everything, like me justifying, you know, spending my tithe money on that car, right? But it gets worse than that um, if you're in dire financial straits. Um, and then your faithfulness to God, your obedience, your honesty, your integrity, everything's on the line, you know, almost more for poor people than it is for rich people. Yeah, I would agree. And it's, but it, I'm not raising one up over the other. It's the human condition. Yeah. Um, we're going to, we're going to quickly go to commercial break. Um, I want to at least do one more of these. We, uh, this is an ad actually. I launched um, a foundation last year called the Royal Falcon Foundation. And as you were talking about your daughter, um, and um, I'm sure that's part of the love that you had that brought your marriage back together. Um, we have two children and we have launched this foundation 
to provide programs for our children and other children as well. And this is a, a nonprofit. Um, we received the IRS determination letter. This is one of the um, ministries, if you will, that my family is involved in. It's called the Royal Falcon Foundation. Um, we are uh, launching a program of service. It's one of the reasons we were down in Florida. Um, we're working with some folks down there to take the camp program there. We're working with a couple of pastors out in Virginia. We did this program in Arizona last year. We've been doing it up on our property here in Washington for several years. So that's the sort of backdrop around this next ad for the Royal Falcon Foundation. We are encouraging our audience um, to consider donating to the program there. Um, which seems appropriate in the context of today's show and giving. Um, when we finish that, we'll come back and we'll uh, we'll dive a little bit deeper into this topic of, as I call it, walking the razor's edge between um, giving and receiving, um, you know, sacrifice and self-sacrifice and being willing to sacrifice. Well, at the same time, fulfilling our responsibility to ourselves and our families mm -hmm. um, to live lives of abundance. Um, so don't go anywhere. We will be right back after this commercial commercial break. Welcome to the Royal Falcon Foundation. Our curriculum and activities inspire and train adolescents through hands-on experiences, fostering growth and empowerment. We're going to try that one more time because um, <laughs> it kind of glitched on my end. Welcome to the Royal Falcon Foundation. Our curriculum and activities inspire and train adolescents through hands-on experiences, fostering growth and empowerment. Through immersive and challenging experiences, we shape young minds to think independently and develop their leadership skills. Our programs foster new friendships and unity, shaping young leaders to tackle real-world challenges with confidence. We believe in equipping the next generation with the skills to become leaders of tomorrow. Join us at the Royal Falcon Foundation and be part of a journey that empowers, unites, and inspires. Visit our website and embrace a world of possibilities today. RoyalFalconFoundation.com Welcome back, everyone. This is Wade Franson. This is the Created in the Image of God show. I'm here with Angela and Charles Todd. We're talking about the abundant life. Um, that QR code, I'll leave it up for a little bit, would take you directly to the website. Don't go there, but we got to show it for, for people watching the video lady, later. Um, we wanted, want you to stick right here with us. And, and Angela and Todd, we'll, um, Charles, sorry, keep calling you by your last name. Angela and Charles, we will also show the uh, QR code for your book, uh, Money is Easy, as well, here in a minute. So um, right before this, we were, you know, diving into scripture, talking about, um, you know, the biblical admonition to believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and the promises that he's been making to his, his uh, trusted um, followers and to those prophets and messengers that he sends to humanity, um, all of whom he has made promises to, all of whom come bringing covenants, uh, as Jesus said, that we might have life and have it more abundantly, which yeah, is, I'm yeah. sure, kind of where that abundant life quote comes from. So, um, so what else, Charles and uh, Angela, what, what else can you share with our audience about your work? Um, I, there's another scripture that came to mind that I want to share real quick just uh, before we move on. Um, and it's really talking about uh, humility, because I think sometimes uh, there's a misconception in the church that if you have money, humble and that poverty equals humility and it does not because humility is getting the attention off of yourself and getting your attention on jesus period so you could have somebody who you could say is egotistical and rich and all he talks about is i'm a self-made millionaire and i've done this and i've done that and i've done all these things and you think what a what a prideful egotistical maniac and you'd be correct but you can also have the other side of that as well too where you have somebody that doesn't have anything and they say well, I'm just, I'm so broke and I don't have anything and I just have my little humble abode and I just have enough just for me and I don't need, what is that? It's the same thing. It's, it's prideful because it's focused on me. So giving uh, from the sense is always getting the attention off of yourself. And the Bible talks about, uh, I'm going to read this scripture as well too, because I want to make sure 
I read it correctly. It's Proverbs 22 and 4. It says, true humility and fear of the Lord leads to riches and honor and long life. The thing you have to realize is that fear in the Hebrew there is the word uh, yara. If I mispronounce that to my Jewish friends, I apologize. It means a moral reverence or a deep attitude of respect. So that fear is not like trembling, fear and trembling of God. It means respectful of God. So it's saying that true humility leads to riches, honor, and long life. So if you reverse that, you could say false humility could lead to the opposite things, to a short life, to poverty, the other type of things. So that's just, that's a myth, I think, sometimes that comes up about people that have money can't be humble enough to be farther than the truth. Because like I said, it, it stems off of getting the attention off yourself and putting it on Jesus. Amen. So I, I want to <clears throat> dig into something um, here that that's, relates to society. Now, I've shared with you guys, and also my audience mostly knows, you know, my background of this kidnapping, where I was smuggled out of the country and taken to Sweden. One of the things that happened there was I was now suddenly a fourth grader living in a different country, different language, different culture. Everything was different. One of the things that was very different was that in Swedish society back then, um, and I think it probably still is, it was strictly forbidden to do any marketing to children. And, and, and beyond that, there were two government controlled TV stations. Now we in our country don't like government control and, uh, and I, I, I tend to agree with that, right? I'm not a big government guy. I think um, we were created in the image of God, as it says, and um, we are sovereign before God. When God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he put the greater and lesser light in heaven to rule the day and to rule the night. And then he put everything under Adam and Eve's feet, everything. And it extrapolates on this later when it says everything. He didn't withhold anything except for now, for a while, it says we are placed a little lower than the angels. But mm -hmm. even our destiny is, you know, to be inheritors of everything. But there was this governor, this gov this limitation was put, the, the lights in heaven were set there to rule the day and the night. And as I like to describe, we are to submit to the light. Mm -hmm. That is who we submit to. That is what we submit to, the light. Uh, and in the deepest, darkest night, you have the moon to guide you or the stars. So God is never, even in the darkest of dark, God's light will always be shining from some place. And of course, in the broad daylight, um, everyone whose deeds are evil, they're fleeing the light, right? My point is, he created Adam and Eve as sovereign on the earth, um, submitting only to God, not even to each other in the original state. You know, that came later, right? When uh, the um, challenges came with them eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and essentially entering into the school of hard knocks. And then God places these curses, they're called, which described how the human condition would then unfold. Um, I'm, I'm kind of off track now in this big, broad, sweeping statement. <laughs> but, getting, but getting back to, uh, in, in Sweden, government TV, there were no advertisements at all. And it was strictly forbidden to advertise to children. Whereas in America, where I had left, the TV was the babysitter. And the children and my dad used to get furious because I would get up early Saturday morning and sit in front of the Saturday cartoons for like, you know, six hours. You know, they'd start at like 7 a.m. And, you know, back then there was no Internet. There were no phones. But every Saturday morning, man, it was Kidtopia, you know, where you could go and watch those cartoons for four or five, six hours. And then, of course, commercials. And as this infrastructure as this ecosystem evolved the most sophisticated psychological manipulative techniques ever imagined or created by man were targeting these young impressionable minds and basically ripping a hole in your soul telling you that there's something wrong with you unless you have this thing, right? And really feeding into your covetousness, right? I think we're going to follow up this show with um, 
and I've teed this up, right? The, the, the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, right? Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's, right? Um, coveting is that wrong relationship that you were talking about with money or with things. But here, um, you know, I was suddenly sent for a loop and a shock in a society with kids who were not brought up or trained on that. And those young uh, kids in Sweden were much more innocent than I was. And I recognized this difference even in fourth grade. And this, the impact of this awareness fed into my relationship with materialism when I came back to the US. And so my point my point here is that that relationship to money and our desires, right, is what we have to be aware of and conquering. Um, Charles, Angela, your reactions to this? Yeah, I think I mean, even Paul taught the Corinthians about the proper ways of handling money. So people, even during Paul's time in the church, had money. So he had to teach them how to have the right relationship with them. So like anything, I think that you, know, you have to be taught how to, how to earn money, how to make money, how to manage money, doing all those different types of things that you need to do. But there's also, you know, there's, there's lessons on how to actually have the right relationship with money. So like I said earl earlier, you use money to bless people. You don't use people to make money. So well, and you a, were talking earlier about what, you know, what led to your, the collapse of your ecosystem financially, you know, going out and buying the red and the black car, right? So as the money became, became rolling in, hyper you know, yeah, those, those, those impulses that, that are fed through the materialism that fuels our society, um, they have to be managed. They have to yeah. be, those, those impulses have to be conquered uh, through the spirit of God. Well, well I was, and now it's... Say, I say now that everything that Amazon and I have is for sale or can be given away. And we've, we've given cars away. We've bought cars for people. We've paid people's entire debts off. We have been able to send people's uh, children to college, paid people's rent or mortgages for entire years, all these different types of things. And once again, I don't say this to brag on what we are doing or what we've been able to do. We've came from a complete brokenness where God has blessed us to be able to do that, to be a blessing. And we've had some great business deals that have happened. You know, we've had some really good money making deals and whatever they may be. And, you know, we thank God and we're excited when that stuff happens. But when we go to on a ministry trip where we're assigned to go and to minister to a family or to an individual and we end up sowing a seed into their life. When we do that, when we give them that gift and they don't even know what it is, walk away, we ball. It's <laughs> like it's like we just drive the car just bawling because mm -hmm. that joy of blessing other people yep. is like nothing else. It's like you can make the biggest deal, the most money. Greater like, love well, has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. And that includes our wealth. But if we haven't accumulated any wealth, we don't have the ability to help other people with their financial challenges. Right. Well, and, and there's and, also and the scripture the that says, if you being good in this world know how to give good gifts to your mm -hmm. children, how much more your father in heaven? Right. Matthew 7, the, 11. the joy that we had just and and have doing that in that moment, it's so overwhelming. Like he was saying, we would just be crying in the car because you're so there. It's an unspeakable joy. How much more does God want to bless you in those things where we didn't judge them for the sin that they were in, which they were in some pretty bad sin that we found out later. We had no idea. We right. just went on there to love them, to bless them, to sow a seed to them, which blew them away. And when they were crying when we left, I mean, for like a week straight, they were crying and they were calling like, you answered our prayer. This is a minute, you know, it's just, it's mind-blowing it's almost like a window of heaven the lord allows you to go in just to see his heart just for a little tiny bit it's just like a little seed yeah so you just you, you just actually helped me connect a couple of dots here because it's you know 
sorry, you know, maybe that that whole TV thing and childhood in America. And there's this coming of age where you get a car, right? At least you used to be. Kids used to want to drive and couldn't wait to get their license. I hear that that's changing in the modern era. But anyway, so, you know, I, I then, um, after that experience with the car, I started tithing. And the next thing you know, I got, I got a great job and um, I was diligent at it and I got promoted and it was a unionized thing within the um, grocery store system. So I, I became a journeyman food clerk, which doesn't sound like much until you start getting double time and a half for working <laughs> holidays uh -huh. and it's unionized and you've got nighttime premium. And I'm 19 and I'm blessed with getting to live um, with somebody where I don't have to pay rent. And so for me, you know, it wasn't $50,000 a month, but the money was rolling in for this little 18, 19 year old. So the next thing you know, I have three cars, right? I have a Firebird Esprit, which is basically a Trans Am without, without the trim. And I, and I had a um, Camaro, an older one. And I had this Chrysler New Yorker, which was my winter car up in Alaska, right? Because it was a tank and it, it was old and it didn't matter if I got into a fender bender or slid into the ditch. Anyway, so, but I'm, but I'm having problems with these cars and with speeding. And I got into the situation <laughs> where I tried to outrun the police. I tried to outrun the police and I'm literally doing 130 miles an hour oh, with, the, no. with the state troopers in pursuit. Oh, and I... No. And I turned my lights off and I'm 19. I turned my lights off. It's nighttime because I'm working nights and um, I'm on my way to work. And I was, I was living 40 miles away because I was, I was back home after getting sick. Right. And um, I think I was only home for the weekend on this, in this case, to visit my younger sisters. Um, I, I still didn't really like my dad or stepmother, but I liked being around my younger sisters. So, um, so I'm now driving to work and I'm late for work and I have 10 points on my license. So this, this, <laughs> state, this state trooper was in between, you know, the divided highway and I knew he had his radar gun out and I'm screwed now. I'm like, so, okay, so if I stop, I'm going to lose my license. I might as well go for it. Really stupid 19 year old decision. So I take an exit that I didn't know. It's the middle of the night. I have air shocks on my Firebird Esprit. So it's kind of jacked up in the back. The lights are pointing down. I turn them off. <laughs> take the exit at 130 miles out, turn them back on. And by the time I realize what's going on, one, one branch of the road goes back on the freeway and the other branch goes under it with this, you know, brick bridge or tunnel. And I, in my uncertainty, I, I, I realize if I try to take this turn, that's going to be me smeared across that brick tunnel, or I'm going to go back up on the freeway. So I, I did neither. And I just, froze i slammed on my brakes and i went flying off this embankment about 100 miles an hour oh my gosh and um it was like a 10 15 foot drop and i came and there was still snow not on the freeway but it was like april and there was snow down in there and i went plowing into the snow and this massive mushroom cloud of steam rose up from the engine because the snow was packing into the engine and um now i'm like crap right and the the you know the state trooper had not seen me take the exit because i had turned off my lights and i was i went around a corner so i knew he didn't know that i went there but then um, he so, was like okay what is this well exactly exactly so exactly so so here's me in my teenage brain you know this is a warning teenagers don't have much of a brain but in my teenage brain i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna go under that freeway and hitchhike into town and report my car stolen or hitch hitchhike back home and report my car stolen. Oh my gosh. And so, but I'm, my footprints are in the snow. Right. And then I realized oh. I left my jacket in the car. So that's going to blow my cover story. So now I'm going back to the car to get my jacket. And while the state trooper is coming back down the other way. And, you know, he sees, cause he saw the mushroom cloud. He comes back down, you know, from that exit ramp. And um, it's like 11 o'clock at night, by the way. And so, he gets out his spotlight. He, you know, it's like he dances across the footsteps to see me crouching in the snow there, pulls out his gun. And with, with, you know, a lot of expletives tells me that my rear end is, is toast. If I don't get my blankety blank rear end back up on that, you know? And so I end up in jail. My dad bails me out. Cause you could do that. He wasn't happy. Trust me. I won't even go there. I went back to look at the site of the accident. This is the whole point of this story. 
And I kid you not, it's in my book. I, I don't tell this to make anybody believe it. But in black and white, the tracks of my car on the pavement in black ended at the embankment and then in white in the snow, like a fake arrow going through the head of a light pole, a metal light pole that was standing. The tracks wow. of my car showed a car going through that light pole and the light pole was untouched. That's and I walked, crazy. I walked around and my car, by the way, had been towed out the other way. So the tracks were not affected and nobody wow. else looked at the tracks because the tracks were like 300 yards back from where they towed out the car. Right. Nobody ever saw this, but I went back and I looked at those tracks. This was like two days later after I got my car out of impound. Right. And um, I walked around and around that light pole and that's when I realized I was not being a good boy. <laughs> that was your only realization? <laughs> no, my realization is I knew I wasn't being a good boy. That was an awareness. My awareness was I was anything but a good boy. I was like you, Charles, managing the nightclubs and blowing my money. And but, the Lord but... saved you anyway. Exactly. Right. So though my father did not treat me like the prodigal son, my heavenly father did. Absolutely. And here's the interesting thing. And this is the dots that I never connected before. My car was untouched. It, that landing in that snow was like a feather. I had, I had to pay for a, a front end alignment. That was it. Well, the interesting thing is you were talking about tithing earlier and right. there, there are tithers rights. And if you know how to right. use your tithers rights properly, you can rebuke the devourer because well, the tithe. I was, I was, I was tithing. See, I was obedient to God. But, but even to if your, your point, father was, you well, still there, under your father's covenant of tithing. Well, there, there were, there were, there was alcohol and drugs involved in my life at that time. You follow me? Um, yes. Because of, because of, difficulties and challenges, but I was paying my tithes and I was going to church and trying my best to obey God, but failing miserably every day. And I you knew were, it. You were just a patron at our nightclub, probably. <laughs> <laughs> at yeah. the nightclub business. And so <laughs> my, 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 my point is, I just realized that's why the car was completely unharmed. I know why he saved my life. But he didn't have to save the car. You follow me? Yeah, absolutely. But, but I never realized it before because my car had been wrecked when I went, didn't pay the tithes. And now my car was saved, even though I was being disobedient by trying to outrun the police right. <laughs> and running out there. So I don't know. It's just, so, sorry, I just had to share that because it, you know, it, no, it's you had, a couple it of dots connected. It, it's coming back full circle. Yeah. You know, that's just the grace of God, you know, and, even and, when you, you yeah. didn't earn it, you don't deserve it. Right. You, you know, his heart is to bless you all the way through and through. No matter well, how and, that, that, was. and of it's course, you know, you. you know, it goes without saying that was the moment when my life turned because I realized, hey, I'm not getting another get out of jail, get out of death free card. Right. Right. This, and, and therein lies the grace, because right. once you receive grace like that and you have a revelation of it, you don't want to go back and sin anymore. Well, I already didn't. I already didn't, is. but it gave me the strength and the power. And and then I realized, you know, I started taking steps. And that's when I left Alaska and went to get my degree in theology because I knew I needed to get the heck out of there. All oh, the people, all the places, you know, right. all the friends. You know, I couldn't escape every every corner. You know, it's like they say when somebody's trying to quit smoking. They know where every cigarette machine is. When somebody's trying to quit drinking, they know where every bar is. I don't know where the cigarette machines are or the bars in our town, but the people with those challenges, they do. And yeah. another way of saying it is uh, opportunity only knocks once. Temptation leans on the doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry for dominating here, but I had to share that sort of yeah, experience. That good, and um, that's a good story. I love that you just had a revelation of it. So I'll, I'll flip it back over to you guys now to sort of you know wrap this all up, and then we'll go to the um, to the audience comments here and and give a copy of your book away. I know we're a little over time already, but this has been awesome. The story reminds me of Psalms ninety one. His angels shall lift you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against their stone. Yeah. They lifted your car up, lest you dash your car against the pole. 
Yes. <laughs> well, bottom line is that story is really for nobody else but me. It changed my life. It doesn't matter if anyone else believes it or not. I walked around that light pole like six, seven times, shaking my head like you, you, this can't be real. That's crazy. We've I've had two near death experiences, and uh, we we were tight. Oh, I think we. I think it was the the one with Daryl in Arizona. Were we going to church and just kind of throwing money in the bucket? I'm just trying to figure out, like, did we tithe yes. then? No. <laughs> no, but we were going to church. I mean, I think we were throwing some money in the bucket. And we had to have been. But anyway, the, my point being mm -hmm. is, yeah, a couple of near-death experiences. Um, and when people tell me these stories, I, um, sometimes I will ask, well, a, were you, are you tithing? And or B, um, who is who in your family is praying for you? Because usually there's a, a praying someone, parent, sister, brother, whatever. Somebody in the family is praying for the family. Well, it's nice when we have those situations where we know it was only the grace of God that saved us from something really bad happening. But some of the times I've thanked God for the times where He saved my life. I didn't even know like I yep. did, you're completely unaware that he, your life was just spared somehow so thank you lord for all the times that you've spared me you've protected me that you know your your favor surrounds me like a shield and thank you for all the times when i didn't even know that you saved me or you blessed yep. me and i didn't even thank you for it <laughs> yeah. How he's doing behind the scenes that you're not even aware of right well and i know we're wrapping up here and so I just want to give a practical step that people can practice. So, you know, when we were giving to people certain dollar amounts, we had to believe God for that and then have that money in our account in order to be able to sow it. So if someone has a heart to give or if someone has uh, wants to, to do something for somebody, I would say pray obviously, but see it happening in your mind. See the end. The, the scripture says, you know, go to the end. It's finished. See the finished. See the finished part. Don't worry about the middle and how it's going to get there and rationalize in your own mind. And yes, you still need to be diligent. You still need to operate with wisdom and, you know, not go out and, you know, blow all your money on something, especially when you have a heart to do something and you're, and you're being diligent with how you want to do that. But when you see the end of the matter, it will be there in order for you to execute his will, which is to give and to bless somebody. So a practical thing is to just pray, see the end and see it happening, and then allow the Lord to work it out in your life and things will start to come. A call will come, something interesting will happen your way. Someone will come up to you with an opportunity. Someone will give you money. And then before you know, it, you're going to be like, wow, I have you know, I have this money to give to this person, which I did not ever have before. So, and then, and then you better follow through on your you intention and promise. Right. Instead of getting that roll. car with your tithe money, you better <laughs> get it as intended. Um, but it will happen. And so that's a very, very practical step. Just pray, see the end and let God do it. So true. Thank you. Yes. Any, any other uh, practical steps? We haven't really got into the mechanics and the points and tips in your book, but <clears throat> we are going to look at the comments now and give away a copy of that to somebody. <clears throat> but Charles, any uh, last minute comments or tips or thoughts? Uh, well, you know, Angela's just kind of talking a little bit about giving and we touched a little bit on that earlier. Um, I would like to encourage people. One thing that I've learned is um, to, when it comes to your giving, pray about it and be directed. One of my uh, confessions that I have every day is that I spend money by divine direction, wisely and fearlessly, knowing my supply is always endless and immediately. And I pray and declare that same thing about my giving, that my giving is very directed, that you know we have nine different ministries that we're partners with that we give on a monthly basis. And then we have other things that we do, our own ministry and other things that we do. Um, but every month I sit down and pray for those ministries, for those ministry leaders and to be directed on what to give into those. Um, so like Angela said, if you have a heart to give like some, maybe you hear there's a need, they're building a church or whatever it may be. 
and you say, I want to give $1,000 to that, but you don't have $1,000, like Angela said, pray for it. Lord, uh, you, your word says that you provide seed to the sower. Therefore, I believe your word. I trust your word. And I would like to have the seed of $1,000 to sow into this to this organization, this church, whatever it may be. In Jesus' name, amen. Simply that, that simple. And like Angela said, just keep seeing it happening. So that's one way to do it. But sometimes God will deposit something into you to tell you to do something. And with our giving through our ministry, it's always been um, very, not just uh, directional, but also to the very dollar figure that sometimes we didn't have that money. So God told us to give something to somebody and it took some time for us to be able to put that together. So there's a couple different ways to go about your giving us. You know, I think sometimes we just think about, okay, I made a thousand dollars. Here's a hundred dollars. There's my tithe. It's drop in the bucket and that's it. It's like, we like to take our money that we give and we like to, if we are writing checks with it, we like to put it out on the counter and lay hands on it and pray and take communion over it. It's just like when, you know, Melchizedek brought, uh, or when Abraham bought the tithes to Melchizedek, they broke bread. You know, I brought out the wine, broke the bread. You know, we do well, things. And again, yeah. divi divine, divine inspiration here. That is a perfect segue to my final comment. And that is, I want to have you guys back on the show because what we really didn't talk about at all is the second tagline of creating an image of God, the role of religion in society, right? So when we did that third tithe way back when, which I talked about at the beginning of the show, that was really the uh, the, the official um, social security system for ancient Israel, that third tithe, mm -hmm. right? The widows and orphans tithe. Um, and yet, how is that administered? Well, it was to be laid up in the city. It wasn't given to a central government. It was to be laid up in the city. And my view on that is that, again, you're talk, you talked about the relationship to money and the relationship to giving and the relationship to people that you're giving it to. So if you lay the, the third tithe, as we used to call it, the widows and orphans tithe, whatever, however you calculate that, there's a bunch of, there's a debate, which is why I don't get into doctrine. I'm not going to tell people that I fully understand the tithing system and how it should be applied today. Um, because the third tithe was for the widows and orphans, not from the widows and orphans, right? The widow's might was perhaps not a tithe at all. You follow me? So that's between the individual and God, in my opinion, and God honors the heart. So I don't want to get into that part. What I do want to talk about is you lay up the tithe in the city and the widows and orphans of that city are benefiting from that tithe. There's a connection between the giver and the receiver. This is not a federalized social security system, which turns into programs of entitlement, <clears throat> which do not actually help the people. Don't solve those spiritual problems. Don't solve those gaping holes in the heart that can come only from knowing that somebody is not only helping you, but adding their prayers. And that money was prayed over. And the bonds that are formed that help, you know, you, you mentioned somebody that you gave money to that later had drug problems, but the fact of the gift and the love helped bring them out of that. But that doesn't happen if you don't have a relationship with the giver. So yeah. we can get more into this and talk, you know, about the difference between a society in which you have people generously giving to support others versus, you know, massive taxation um, to provide, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not speaking against taxes. I'm not speaking against social security. I'm saying there's a balance here. You know, what you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, absolutely. And then there's also, what we can start getting into is speaking to your, to your seed, speaking to it. Um, there's that. And then there's also, uh, when connecting with the tithe, babe, you said something the other day and you were like, okay, listen to this. When the widow and who is it, Elisha went to her and said, hey, give me this. What do you got? What do you got? The yeah. And she's like, I only, I only have this much in the jar. Right. And she didn't want to give it to me. You're talking about that story. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. Two. yeah. Yeah. There's two. I mean, he, he, he was directed to go to the widow for right. the widow to take care of him in a time of famine. Right. I mean, there's a drought. There's no food. And for the widow to provide for him. Right. For the, for the man of God. 
<laughs> this widow to provide. What does she say? I'm gathering up a couple of sticks, two sticks, so I can cook this last bit of cake so I can prepare it and mean my son can die. Right. That's that's how far we were. So yep. he said, make it for me and bring me a cup of water too. So, you know, what would happen today if, you know, let's just say a, a pastor went to Africa and he was going to go down to this desolate place and he found a widow and he said, hey, whatever you got in your refrigerator, give it to me. <laughs> That'd be all over social media, all over the news. Pastor takes widow's last. <laughs> <laughs> like, the whole Disaster. Part of that, you know, by her sewing that into the right. man of God's life, that's why I said that they went on to live many years just off of that. So, you know, right. it's, it's well, cool. and, and, and I love it, but, but I always like to balance things out this razor's edge metaphor, right? Let's not forget that Jesus then said there are shepherds and then there are hirelings, right? Who he equated with thieves, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, <laughs> you know, a true shepherd, a true teacher, a true giver from God, um, that symbiotic relationship between the widow and the man of God um, was what led to the miracle, um, mm -hmm. which Jesus later continued with the loaves and the fishes, right? Um, anyway, you know, and again, he went and gathered up, you know, what do the people have? And he gathered up the fish and the loaves from the people, you know, right? And uh, he took them, what, from a little boy? And of course, that little boy later got to say, hey, guess what me and Jesus did today? Right. <laughs> 12 Amazing. baskets of leftovers. Right. Amazing. So anyway, anyway, I'm sorry. You know, this this is how we roll on this show. I just love the discussion. <laughs> we so, could go on. We could go on. <laughs> right. And, so, uh, I, and, I, and I hate it. I don't like to have the last word, although I tend to try to grab it. So what else, <laughs> what else do you want to share before we then go to the comments? Or do you want to just go to the comments? Yeah, let's go to the comments. All right, so you guys can both see them. Um, if not, I can, you know, sh showcase some of them. But if you have some that you want to highlight, I can drag them into the visible show. Because for our audience, if you didn't know, you're not seeing all the comments. You might see the comments on one YouTube channel. You might see the comments on one Facebook channel or the other or LinkedIn. Um, we get to see them all here in the studio. Well, I would like to say, you know, the even though the books are for kids and from like zero to eight, um, you know, grownups are going to learn a lot too. I mean, they're really written for grownups, um, in a simplified way. And the unique thing about our books is that we asterisk financial vocabulary in the, in the illustrated big fun rhyming pages. And in the back glossary of terms, there's the definition of that word, whatever financial term and a scripture to back it up. So it becomes a learning tool for mom and the kid, especially at night when, you know, so it's not just a one and done, it's a study tool. So if you have like, if you're a homeschool mom and, you know, you can, or you've got small children, or even if not, even if you just want to, you know, read the book yourself and learn more, I mean, because believe me, grownups are going to learn something too, or it's just a great refresher. So, you know, aside from going through and scrolling through everything, if someone really feels like, I want this book, you know, absolutely. Who is that person? Who wants it? You know, I would well, say. Yeah, here was a question early on. I think you guys answered this, but um, uh, maybe not. I don't know if there's anything you want to say about this. How did you, Charles and Angela, decide on the specific financial principles of tithing, saving, investing, giving, and staying out of debt to focus on in your series. I kind of think you answered it, but just in case you wanted to add something. They're kind of like the foundation, I think, of just basic money management from a from a Bible perspective. Yeah, a ton, ton of proverbs that talk about this, right? Because it's very practical advice, very wise advice. Like, like Angela said, each one of our books, whether it's uh, money is easy, giving is easy, Easy, same as easy. Those books, the staying out of debt, those books are going to have loads of scripture in the back on those topics, just on those topics alone. So the Bible is full of that's full of talking about investing, handling, saving, all of that. And sometimes I don't think people realize how much content is actually in the Bible about yeah. money. So these children's books, I mean, like Angela said, you know, not only are they 
uh, you know, educational for the kids, but parents are going to get something out of it too. I guarantee it. <laughs> and yep. you know, we did this because we wanted parents to have a tool because what we found is parents started asking if they could bring their kids into our financial classes yes. so, that, so that their kids could learn. So we knew that parents were interested, but they didn't have the knowledge to teach their kids either. So we thought, Hey man, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs, train a child when he's early in the way that he is, she'll go when he's old, he will not depart from it. So we even say, Hey, if you're pregnant, you got a child in the stomach, read, read to him then. Read, to the womb. Read, yeah. read, read, you know, start reading the scripture to him then don't Bible. I think why it says early is because if it said two or three or four, then it becomes legalistic. And then if you happen to read that scripture and your child was 10, you think I missed the mark already. I'm too late. <laughs> this says early. So it works for anybody basically. Yeah. Better late than never. Right. But early yes. is better. So this comment, I think, came in when you were talking about when you were in the depth of your uh, bankruptcy and divorce and all that. Uh, Jesus was there the whole time. Um, yeah. Never uh, we had a, us. <laughs> then we had a comment, you know, from Tazzy who was sharing a similar situation and everyone thought he was crazy when he then turned to, to God. Um, coming out of it. <laughs> <Good comment. laughs> um, so uh <clears throat> um, a shout out to you angela <clears throat> from hope don't know if you saw that <laughs> um and uh i'm just just looking through here oh here's another question um really for you angela about your educational background in terms of you know you'd mentioned you were a writer and you were um helping to you know create these books um that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I have always been creative. I am a creative producer and I write for um, television and feature films. And I think it just stemmed from, uh, I think so college. What, what kind of education did you have? That's Not what your... I'm going back to is like college. Um, I started doing creative writing in college. Um, I think it just started there. I just started writing, like, you know, papers so you in college. Go, what did you go to college for? I went to college for communications. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> you answered the question. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm trying to think, like, you know, where did the writing really begin? You know, the writing really began when I started writing for television, like doing um, shows and stuff. And then I started being connected with other writers in the business. And then, how, okay, here's here's the my defining writing moment. Our daughter was playing tennis. We had some friends that lived in um, pre pickleball, huh? Pre pickleball. Yeah, pre pickleball. This is the tennis years, and uh, he is the creator of like Bruce Almighty, Evan Almighty, Barnyard, Nutty Professor. Wow. His name's Steve Odekirk. Mm -hmm. Him and his wife Tony and their kids play tennis. So Paris would go over to their house and play tennis. And he had a clubhouse uh, back in the tennis. So when the girls were playing, I would just kind of peruse his clubhouse. But he had all of his accolades and everything out in the clubhouse. And I'm telling you, it's a spirit. And so um, it got on me. And so I would just sit and I would talk with him and he would mentor me and I would just ask him questions about writing and how to write. And he always used to say in his one hot tip for me, and I'll tell it for anybody who's who's thinking of writing is to just throw up on paper. I tell this to Charles all the time because <laughs> don't ever write something linear. Just don't just throw up your thoughts on paper because then later you're going to go, Oh, this goes here and that goes here. And then this goes here and that goes there. Or you can ha have someone help you go, Oh, here you go. And here you go. Um, so don't ever just get so wrapped up in your mind that you're, you don't get anything out. Cause a lot of people think, I'm going to write one day or one day I want to write my book. And write What's that Snoopy <laughs> line? It was a dark and stormy night. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and every night it's a dark and yeah. stormy night. <laughs> yeah. Just get one word out and then you'll be surprised that it starts to flow. So yeah. how are you getting your happy Well, place? and then this, this comment from Tazzy seems to fit into that. God works in mysterious ways. If we can figure out God, then it's not God. 
So you were you were <laughs> anyway. being guided and led there. Um, That's a good one to close with. Okay, congratulations, <laughs> you got the book. <laughs> well, well, awesome because uh, I think Tazzy won a book a few uh, weeks ago, and he was saying I haven't gotten my book yet, so we got to look into that. And if he hasn't gotten it, <laughs> we can we can he or she I don't know. Sorry, I don't know why I said he. I have no idea. Um, but um, I think we did get his address, but that may be. Anyway, so um, I will definitely uh, honor that. Um, there were there were a lot more great comments, but we are over time. And uh, Tazzy, you're the you're the proud winner uh, again. So um, if you're still there, which I don't think you are, because I saw earlier that you your phone was dying. But we um, also have uh, free resources on our website. So if someone wants to go to toddworldwide.org, then our um, our workbooks that we created to go with the books, you can actually print those off, and those are all free on our website. Um, and then you can get just like a soft cover. You can go to Amazon. You can type in money is easy. Angela Todd, Charles Todd. Um, you know, we've got the soft cover of the book or the digital copy. It's like three, two ninety nine, three ninety nine. It's very reasonable. What, what was that website again? I'll post that up here. Todd worldwide. Dot O R G. Is that it? Just that? Um, yeah, just toddworldwide.org, or they can go to money, Mike, and the gang.com. Awesome. Well, there or, you have it. Oh, go Amazon. ahead. Yeah, or Amazon. Yeah. Um, but on Amazon, they probably don't have the free stuff, but you can find it there. Right. I will, I will also put up. Hey, kids, it's Money Mike. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my ears. Sorry. Um, I, I meant to, I meant to um, do the QR code. Sorry. Um, am I, am I, you know, multitasking here? So there's that QR code one more time. So there's just one more thing left to do tonight. And that is for me to share with our audience who is going to be here next year, next week. <laughs> oh my, I'm, uh... <laughs> oh my, it's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I uh, just give me a moment here. I got to find um my notes because i don't know who is going to be here until i find the uh chart oh yes we have a very special guest next week it is a returning guest um barbara brion who is the uh pastor or the associate pastor of the beulah baptist church in virginia and the author of blooming for christ and she is the one that is um driving the uh, program for Royal Falcon Foundation out in Tappahannock, Virginia. Oh, wow. um, sh she will be back and we will be talking about that program, sharing some video clips. Um, it's been so amazing. She's had three different people volunteer to donate land for the program down there and um, nice. talk about blessings and um, abundance. So we're um, we're working on, you know, helping them set up a foundation to receive this because the Royal Falcon Foundation doesn't want that land. Um, we want to make sure that the, the local people are able to receive that gift and work with it um, and build up their own organization to run these programs. So we'll be talking about all of that success story and um, where we're going next. Um, we have an amazing lineup, you know, after that as well in the coming weeks. Um, the popularity of the show just keeps growing. And thanks to all of you fans <clears throat> who are here, many of you every week, and who are hopefully sharing it, subscribing. Keep doing that. And um, check out uh, Charles and Angela's book. Um, go to that website, download the free, free resources. And, you know, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Angela and Charles, I would love to have you back and dig deeper into um you know, where does all this go from here? Can can we begin to transform society one heart at a time, one gift at a time, one one session at a time, one educational class at a time, and then one miracle at a time, right? Where God yeah. then jumps in and backs up your work. Greater signs uh, than these, Jesus said, will follow you. Yeah, amen. Um, so... That's it for tonight. Um, barring any last words, comments from our esteemed guests. Just thank you for having us on tonight. We really appreciate it. Giving us an opportunity to uh, use your platform to 
get the good news out on Jesus, his goodness, his grace, his love. Just keep doing it. You're doing a good job. Yeah. Amen. And so, Lord, we just pray for everyone who watched tonight, anyone yep. who's going to watch later on, anyone connected to this ministry, anyone connected to whoever wants to join in, any... Um, Lord, we just ask a special blessing over each and every household. We declare the blood of Jesus in Psalms 91 over all of the families that you would bless them indeed, enlarge their coast and their territory. And Lord, I just thank you for uh, just Wade, his family and his ministry yep. and ask that you super abundantly bless it in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for those prayers. We will be thinking and praying for you as well um, going forward, and I'll be looking for an opportunity to invite you back on the show. Yay. Thanks, Wade. Until Thank next you. week, everyone, may God be with you and see you next week, same time, same place for Created.